Most of the time, setting up animation events in Unity is a real pain. You have to go into the animator controller, find your animation clip, only to discover that it's read-only, so you have to come out, copy, possibly rename and move it, then open it again, get back to the point in the clip where you want the event to fire, and of course, don't forget to create a public method with the right signature for this to even work. What if instead you could add a state behavior script like this one, name your event, and be able to preview in the scene exactly when it's gonna fire? This is what we're gonna build today. Let's get started. Unity's state machine behavior is a specialized scriptable object that allows you to add custom logic to animation states within an animator state machine. It has some predefined methods that we can override, such as on state enter, on state exit, on state IK, and so on. We're going to primarily make use of the on state update method to track how far along playing an animation we are so that we can fire our events at the correct time. For each of these events, I'm going to refer to them by a unique string name, and I'll just call that event name, but we're also going to keep track of a normalized time value, and that'll be how far into an animation do we actually want to fire a particular event. Let's also add a boolean here, has triggered. We'll use this as a circuit breaker. If we have looping animations, we'll only fire an event once. So let's override the onStateEnter method and make sure that has triggered is false when we come into this state. And then we'll handle our logic by overriding the onStateUpdate method. Inside of the animator state info struct, normalized time can actually exceed one when the animation loops. For example, 2.5 means two full loops plus 50% through the third loop. So by applying modulo 1f, it isolates the fractional part of the normalized time, and that'll give us the progress within the current loop, regardless of how many times the animation has repeated. Then all we have to do is check to see if our circuit breaker is triggered, and check to see if the current time is greater than equal to the trigger time that we've set. And if it has, we're going to fire an event in a new method, and I'm going to set that circuit breaker to true. So let's come down and create a new method here, notify receiver. That'll take in our animator, now this method is going to communicate with a component we're going to build and put on this game object called an animation event receiver. So let's get that component. As long as it's not null, let's call a method that we're going to build on it on animation event triggered. We'll pass in the name of the event and the listener can handle it however it wants. Now on that listener, I'm going to want to store some information that connects that string name two actual things we want to do in the game. For that, I'm going to use a unity event, which I'll call on animation event. And let's make this serializable so that we can update this in the inspector. Okay, let's move on to the listener class, animation event receiver. Here we'll expose a list of those animation events so that we can configure them. Then we need to write the public method that our state behavior is going to be calling. So we'll have a public void on animation event triggered where we take in the event name. Now, assuming that we're only creating one animation event per string, let's find the first one in the list that corresponds to this name. Then all we have to do is invoke the Unity event. So now we've got the components necessary so that a state inside the animator controller can send a message out to a listener in the scene so that we can take action at a certain point in time. Let's put it all together. So I brought in Robot Kyle for this demo. I'm going to double click on his animator controller and bring that up. I'm going to select his jump start state and then click on add behavior in the inspector. Here I'm going to add that animation event state behavior component that we wrote first. Let's give it an event name of on jump, and then I'm going to set the trigger time to just something random, 0.222. So at 22% of the way through the animation, it'll call the method on the receiver. Let's select robot Kyle and come back to the scene view. Here we can add the receiver component. So we're going to give it the same event name. We're going to listen for on jump. And when that happens, let's make it do something else. I have a particle spawner here. So I'll add this component as well, and then I can drag this reference up into the Unity event, and on the particle spawner, I've got a spawn VFX method, and then I just need to find a prefab to drag into there to spawn, and then when we go to play, we should see a little puff of smoke at the 22% mark of the way through the jump animation. So let's jump, and yeah, of course, we see our particles get instantiated, no problem. So just to have a sanity check, let's go back into the animator and let's change the time to be something much later. Let's see, almost 80% there, 78%. So now when I jump, yeah, we don't get the VFX until we're up in the air. Now that's all well and good, but if we come back here and look at the state behavior, 
There's not a whole lot of precision going on here, and you've got to do a lot of fiddling around to figure out exactly what the right time is in your animation when you want something to happen in the game world. Let's make some tooling that'll make this a lot easier. First, let's take a few seconds and create a property drawer for those animation events. This is going to be really straightforward. We'll just override on GUI, then we'll begin a new property block. Let's get references to the serialized properties within the animation event class. First, event name, then on animation event. Then we'll define a rectangle area for drawing the event name property. We'll draw a similar rectangle for the Unity event. Let me just wrap that around. Then what we'll do is override the get property height. This is to define the total height needed to draw the entire property. We'll get a reference again to the Unity event because we'll let the get property height method calculate how much space is actually needed there. Then we're going to use one single line plus that height plus four more for a little bit of space in between each one. Coming back into on GUI, let's make sure we actually draw the properties. So we'll draw the event name, then we'll draw the Unity event. We want the Unity event expanded, so we have the last parameter here is true. And then finally, we'll end the property block, and we're all done. Okay, that'll make our Unity events look nice in the inspector, but the bigger task is to add more functionality inside the animation controller. So to do that, we are going to make a custom editor here. So a custom editor of type animation event state behavior. Let's have a field that'll store a clip used for previewing the animation. Then let's have another one that'll store the time that we want to show inside that clip. We'll override on inspector GUI, and as a first order business, let's draw the default inspector. To make this work, we're going to select an object in the scene that we can preview the animation on, which in this case is Robot Kyle, but we're also going to need a reference to this component, the animation event state behavior. And that's easy because that's the target of this editor. So to make this custom editor a little bit more helpful, let's make sure that we're validating that the user has selected all the right things. We'll have a new method here where we start with an empty error message. Now let's find out what the user has selected in the hierarchy. That's selection.activeGameObject. Now, if they haven't selected anything, let's give a helpful message for that. If they have selected something, we'll keep going. The next thing we want to know is, is there actually an animator on that game object? So let's verify that. If there isn't, we can give a message about that. And then finally, let's make sure that within that animator, there's actually an animator controller. And again, if there isn't, let's say something useful and return null. If we make it through all of these checks, then we're fairly confident that we can display an animation on the object in the scene view. So let's return a reference to that animator controller. So that validates what's going on in the scene view. Let's make another private method here that will first of all call that method that we just wrote. But then I also want to validate that we can actually get an animation clip to use. So if there was something wrong with trying to validate what was going on the scene, we'll just get out of here right away. We've already figured out the error messages. We don't need to do anything else. Otherwise, we're going to keep going and we're going to find the state inside of the animator layers that contains the target state behavior that we're looking for. Here we can just use link. We're looking for the first animation state in the animator state machine where our component is present in that state's behaviors. If we can't find it, we're going to return null. So if we did find a matching state, then that state's motion should be an animation clip, or it could be a blend tree. We're only dealing with animation clips in this video. We'll assign that into the preview clip field. However, if we couldn't find that clip, if it's null, then we'll give an error message here as well, and we'll return false. Otherwise, we return true, which means everything is valid. We found the animation clip for this state in the animator controller, and we have an object in the scene we can play it on. Okay, all done with validation. Let's collapse that up and keep working on our main method here in on inspector GUI. So let's have a conditional block here. As long as everything was valid, then we're able to preview that animation clip. We'll write that in a separate method. I'm going to add one more line. Let's display the actual time within that animation clip and not just the normalized time. Let's add just a little bit of space as well. Now, suppose we did have some error messages. Let's have an else statement here. We can use a help box just to show whatever messages we want to put out to the inspector. Almost done. Let's preview this animation clip. We'll have a new method here. That's just going to take in the state behavior. We'll have a sanity check. Just make sure that preview clip is not empty for any reason. So long as that's OK, let's figure out the preview time by multiplying the clip length by our normalized trigger time. Now we can start Unity's animation mode. We can sample the animation at the calculated preview time, and then we can stop animation mode to finalize the preview. So we're going to preview that clip at that specific time on the object we have currently selected. Well, let's go make sure this works. 
I'm going to turn on Bones Assistant, which is extremely useful for many things, not the least of which is being able to visualize your rig in the scene view. This is going to be handy for a task that's coming up. But for now, let's turn our attention over to the inspector where you can now see a little help box that's telling me, please select a game object with an animator to preview. So I'm going to lock this inspector so I keep it front and center. And I'm going to go over to the hierarchy and actually select Robot Kyle. I haven't written any code yet so that the inspector will redraw itself, but if we mouse over it again, it will redraw and suddenly our changes will take effect. Not only is Robot Kyle now 78% of the way through the jump animation, but in the inspector, we can actually see that's 31 seconds into the jump animation clip. Now, if I were to start dragging this slider around, this is extremely useful for us to be able to figure out exactly when we want events to be fired from this particular state. So if we want that ball of dust to come right as he's about to launch into the air, maybe we'd set it at something like 10 or 20 percent. But if we want it to be a little bit later after he's already airborne, or if we want it to be closer to when he's launched into the air, he's already off the ground, maybe 60, 70 percent is better. Anyway, we wrote a lot of code. None of it really affects the runtime, but let's hit play and just do a couple jumps around, make sure that everything is working just the way we expect. And of course, it still is. So. There's one more problem. Notice that after I hit stop, Kyle remains in this pose that we last had him at. And in fact, he'll never actually go back to a T pose. Being able to display the animation on Kyle in the scene view while I'm precisely trying to figure out when to fire events, that's great. But the rest of the time, I, I would just rather him be in T pose. So let's figure this out. I'm going to create a new static method here in force T pose. And not only am I going to use it from this class, but I'm also going to make it a context action that we can just right click an object in the hierarchy and enforce a T-pose on any humanoid animation. So let's get a reference to the currently selected game object. If nothing's selected or we can't get an animator on the thing that's selected or the animator doesn't have an avatar, we're going to bail out of here because there's nothing we can do. Otherwise, we're going to get an array of all of the skeleton bones from the animator's avatar. Now we're going to iterate over a list of all of the enum values that exist for human body bones. So every human body bone that we could possibly reference, we're going to loop over them all. Now when it comes to human body bones, the last bone actually isn't a real bone, so we're going to skip it. So let's get the transform of the current bone. We'll skip if the bone is not found. Next, we're going to try to find the matching bone in the skeleton for this human body bone. If we can't find one, we'll just continue. If we can, then we're going to start doing some resetting. So first, the hips bone is special because it often needs its position reset in addition to rotation because it controls the root position of the character in world space. For all the other bones and the hip bones, the rotation has to be reset to match the T-pose. So essentially what we're doing here is we're setting the position for the hips and the rotation of all bones to be what they were originally in the avatar. Let's go back to Unity and have a little sanity check. So if I come over to Robot Kyle here and right click, down here in our context menu now we have Enforce T-Pose. And you can see Kyle goes right into that T-Pose, no problem, looks pretty good. Now that's all well and good, but if I was to come back into the animator and start selecting things, as soon as I start meddling around, he's going to go right back into the preview pose because there is no way to switch it off right now. Let's introduce a toggle so we can come in and out of preview mode. First, I'm going to add a Boolean flag at the top, is previewing. And then down in our on inspector GUI, let's just say if we're previewing, then we're going to do something. I'm actually going to come down here and hold down Alt and press up a few times to bring this method call up into this block. Also here, we can add a stop preview button. And if it gets clicked, we'll enforce the T-pose and turn off preview mode. Now we need the inverse of this. So we'll have another button so we can say else. If the preview button gets clicked, then we'll actually just turn on the preview Boolean. Now I want to change the logic a little bit. I don't want to preview the animation clip if somebody's actually clicked the stop preview button. So let's put that into an else statement. That'll save us any weird problems if somebody's clicked stop and it's still showing the preview. That'd be a little strange. And you know what? We don't need to have an else statement with a nested if. Let's just say else if. I'll clean this up a little bit. Okay, I think we're all done. Let's go test this out one more time. Okay, so now we've got a nice preview button. If I click it, it does go into preview mode. We can drag the slider around, no problem. If I hit stop, he goes back into T-pose mode and there's nothing I can do that would take him out of that. In fact, I can continue to drag the slider around 
that's going to change the trigger time, but it's not actually going to show me what's going on in the scene view unless I actually have Kyle selected and I click preview. So I've got it set pretty low, 0.16. Let's just do one more test here. Make sure it's all working, a few jumps. So that looks about right, exactly what I want. He's leaving the ground and a little bit of dust flies out. Now, if I were to unlock this inspector or alternatively put two inspectors side by side, I'd be able to have Kyle selected and continue to work on this. You can see it's very easy to add more Unity events for the on jump. We could also add something else to listen to. Maybe we want to publish something like on attack. And if we were to call our method in the receiver with on attack, maybe we want to do something else. So we've already set up everything to handle this. All we have to do is create more events to fire off inside of the animator. So I hope that for some of you that don't really enjoy Unity's animation event system, which to me is just cumbersome and annoying, this is an alternative approach that's simple and easy to maintain. And of course, you can make this system a lot more powerful. If you want to handle weights and blend trees, be my guest. It's a lot more complicated, but it certainly can be done. And with that, I think I'll wrap it up. Don't forget that we've got a Discord server you can join where it seems like there's something new to learn just about every single day. And of course, subscribe to this channel if you want to catch a new video every Sunday. I'll throw some Something else up on the screen if you want to watch a bit more. Maybe I'll see you there.